As I mentioned, uh, Gary Pisano, I think he's already connected. He should be in a green room online. Gary is a Harry Figge professor uh, at, uh, of business administration and uh, senior associate dean at Harvard Business School. Um, he has a great book out, by the way, look it up, uh, Creative Construction, uh, talks about platform uh, companies, open innovation. So again, more things that resonate with uh, what you'll hear today. Hello, Gary, how are you doing? Great, I'm, I'm doing terrific. Such a real pleasure and honor to, to be with you today. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very excited to get to be part of this event. I will leave you the floor immediately, conscious of uh, our timing. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Again, just an honor and pleasure to be here with you today. It, it, it's such an exciting time in this industry, uh, one that I've been part of in some way, studying, uh, participated in for the last you know, four decades. But I wanna to talk to you about three themes that I think are gonna shape the future of this business of, of bioscience. Uh, the first is the increasing convergence of the worlds of science and business. Kind of a theme here that resonates back to, you know, I know Da Vinci is a part of the theme for you uh, in this meeting, and there's some Da Vinci-esque themes around convergence of two worlds. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, second is this rapid emergence of AI as a tool for drug discovery. And I won't talk about the technical side of that per se, but really more of what are the implications for the business uh, and, the, and the industry. And then, Third um, is the importance of trust, which I think is, is, is becomes all the more important because of the first two things, the first two themes, this convergence of science and business uh, and this, this role of AI. So let, let me dive in now and talk about science and business. Um, you know, historically, uh, science and business lived in two separate worlds. Science was the, uh, the world of academia. It was the world of universities. Uh, not-for-profits, uh, government research entities. Uh, it was a world of publishing, uh, openness, et cetera. And business was the world of companies, capital markets, venture capitalists. Uh, it was a world of you measure progress by, by profits. You, you seek secrecy. And, and by and large, they lived in their separate worlds for, for, for literally, you know, 100, 200 years. Um, uh, th some exceptions, you got organizations like Bell Labs, but, but by and large, science and business lived in their own worlds, um, had their own rules of engagement, very different rules of engagement. Again, one driven by profits, you know, property rights, secrecy, the other driven by openness, um, uh, pursuit of knowledge. Occasionally they would touch bases, but by and large separate. The biotech industry begins to change that. And this begins in 1976 with the formation of Genentech. It's like a seminal event of really a, a, a company that is formed, which is the epitome of this fusion of, of science and business. In fact, if you if the earliest days of Genentech, they didn't have their own corporate offices. They were formed in the City of Hope Medical Center. So they were formed inside an academic medical center, started by a Nobel Prize winner and a venture capitalist. Um, one might expect that as, you know, at the outset of an industry, it might look like that, but then it sort of evolves and the worlds go back to be separate again. We have companies and then we have academics. Um, in fact, the trend has just continued. I believe it will continue that that the bioscience industry, bioscience is a business. It's, it is the convergence of, of business and science. And as the science moves more quickly and we see these dramatic advances in the next you know, decades and centuries. Um, I think it's only to become more pronounced and more important for companies to learn what this means and how to how to operate. And I'll just give you one example, one that I get to, that I have studied academically, but I also get to experience firsthand. Um, I am an academic partner of, a, of an organization in Cambridge called Flagship Pioneering. Some of you may know this organization. You probably have heard of some of the companies they've started. I think the most visible one these days is Moderna. They aspire to do unprecedented science. That's their stated goal. You can go right to their, their, their website to work in areas that no one else, including academics, have worked in um, and to try to take those breakthroughs and create companies and create economic value for their shareholders. So, you know, I get to watch this play out. They hire PhDs and postdocs from the top programs. They compete for those people. 
they have a fellows program, which a few dozen um, uh, PhDs and postdocs come. They get thousands of applications for those. Um, so they look a lot like an academic laboratory. Um, on the other hand, they go out and they raise, you know, billions in venture capital funding. They start companies. They have shareholders or, or, or investors they have to uh, make a return for. They live right at that interface. Um, now, a lot of people say, gosh, this fusion of, of science and business is bad. These are the purists. The purists say, you know what? Uh, when companies get involved in science, they, they corrupt the purity of it. Um, by the way, for business people, you'll see people on the other side of this, on the business side saying, you know, companies shouldn't be getting involved in science. It's, it's, it's a waste of shareholders' money. We have to be driven by profit. I, I think I fundamentally disagree with this view. I actually think the convergence of business and science is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. I think it's better for the world. I think we we have more impact. I think it turns out to be better for science in some way, for the pure pursuit of knowledge. Uh, and it, it, it certainly has much greater impact. And so um, I think we've got this. I think it's going to continue to occur. And I think as organizations, we have to think about the implication. What does it mean to thrive in this fused world? Personally, I think companies that are going to thrive in this fused world are going to have to master a few things. The first is they're going to really have to be what I'll call bicultural. That is, they're going to have to be equally comfortable in the world of business and science and the norms. They're going to have to be adept at the culture of science, the norms of science, and the culture of business. And they're going to have to deal with them. There are tensions in those, openness versus secrecy. Um, there may be times where some things you do are going to seem um, strange purely from a business point of view, such as publishing. I serve on the, I've served on the board of a number of companies, um, some flagship companies, um, where we face these tensions about you know, whether to publish, how much to publish. And there's not easy answers, but I think you do better when you just recognize that there are times where you have to do things as a participant in the world of science that are not necessarily what you would do if you were just thinking about it narrowly from a, a pure business point of view. And that really relates to a second thing that you have to be able to do well. Uh, and M Ambassador Zappia just mentioned it, which is collaboration. Um, one has to become really adept at, at operating in these networks, becoming part of an ecosystem. But these are going to be very um, heterogeneous ecosystems. They're going to have venture capitalists in it. They're going to have companies in it. They're going to have scientific enterprises, universities, and others. And one has to be willing to think about how you contribute to that ecosystem. It's not just a matter of how you take from it, but to be a player in that ecosystem, you also have to be a contributor. Third is the role of experts. And this is a little more controversial. I think companies have to figure out how to learn from the experts out there, but recognize you don't always want to be blinded by them. The more novel the things you try, the fewer the experts there are to guide you. So a lot of times in companies, they're very used to, you know, finding key opinion leaders and asking them for advice. But I think companies who are now operating kind of right on the frontiers of science and getting deeply immersed, some of the things they do are, are there's not going to be experts or the experts are, are not going to have the answers. Uh, and so one has to use expertise as a way to sharpen your own thinking. But in some sense, as a company, you have to become the expert. And then finally, in terms of the practice, the more you get involved with more novel science, the more you really face a world of ambiguity or uncertainty. I've referred to it in my past writing as profound and persistent uncertainty. You're doing unknown things. It takes imagination. Again, we go back to Da Vinci. It takes that kind of, just like you'd have, our artists can have imagination. You need scientific imagination. And a lot of times questions like, you know, that you, I've heard time and time again in, in my career working with companies, uh, when somebody proposes something very novel, you'll, you'll hear almost an automatic response. Well, prove to me it works uh, before it's been tried. Well, that's just simply illogical because when you're doing something really novel, there's no answer to it. You know, of course, I can't prove it to you. We have to explore it. We have to try it. And so it, it's a very different attitude. Let me see if it works. If it fails, let's figure it out. What's my next move? How do we evolve this? And I think we have to, some of our, of the, the classical business tools, and I have to say tools we teach in MBA programs, 
uh, for evaluating investments and making decisions are just not suited for that kind of world where you're in pure exploration mode. You have to be incredibly good at adapting, evolving, trying things. And that takes also, I have to say, an unusual culture. Let me shift to the second theme, artificial intelligence. Now, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence. It's, you know, everywhere, chat GPT. Uh, we hear about how AI can, you know, write poetry and paint pictures. Um, just a personal comment. Look, I'm not interested in artificial intelligence for writing poetry or, you know, it says and we now have AI that can write poetry like Shakespeare. Well, my view is Shakespeare was pretty good at writing Shakespeare. So I don't think we need AI to do that. And we don't need it to create art because as humans, we're amazing at creating art. I think I'm much more interested and I hope society becomes much more interested in using AI to help us figure out some really hard, important problems that affect people's lives. And I think healthcare is exactly that place. Um, you get this question, can AI do science? I, I think the answer to everything is eventually yes. And, 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 it, and again, I'm involved with companies that do use AI or are trying to use AI to discover drugs. Um, will it replace humans? Uh, probably uh, uh, probably not, but let me just pose it this way. The scientist who is working with AI is probably going to be at a big advantage over the scientist who's not working with AI. It's going to be a, a partner. Um, but I'm going to talk less about the science than the implications for the industry of AI. Um, I think it's going to transform the business of pharmaceuticals in fundamental ways. Um, so if you think about it today or over the last, you know, actually decades, there's been very low scale economies in discovery research. So you could start, you know, uh, there's scale economies in downstream development, you know, get into big clinical trials, commercializing drugs, but uh, in discovery operations, small labs can have been able to do just as well as large labs, if not better actually. And this is why, you know, two professors with a discovery in their lab can, can literally start a company with seed financing. Um, and that's why we have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of biotechnology companies around the world doing research, collaborating, licensing out drugs, et cetera. But what if drug discovery becomes increasingly driven by AI? Like all digital technologies, AI has a characteristic. Anytime you need data to fuel something, it has a characteristic, which in economics we call increasing returns to scale. And that means that um, scale begets advantage. So if I'm a larger, I can gain an advantage, but that advantage then enables you to be more successful and therefore increase your scale, which gives you an advantage, which allows you to be bigger. And you can see the, the flywheel effect as it's sometimes called. And we see this in other parts of the digital economy. Think about Amazon. They dominate e-commerce for that reason. The ones you're using Amazon, they've got your data. They can do a better job with their algorithms helps you find the product. So more of us buy more from Amazon, which makes their algorithms better, which gives them more advantage, et cetera. We see this with Apple. We see this with Facebook. We, we see this with Google and other places. This increasing returns to scale. And the question is, what if the same thing happens in AI in drug discovery? So companies that acquire large biological clinical data sets will be better positioned to train their models. They're going to need skill to do it. And there's no guarantee more data will will translate into better models, but it gives them the potential to do it. The better models, the better algorithms will position them to do a better job and a more efficient job in discovery. And if they're successful, they will become beacons for more collaboration of others. You're gonna, if you have a choice between working with a company who's who's got strong AI and, and one with less strong, you're gonna choose the one that's strong. But those collaborations are gonna be conduits for more data. Um, and so as their data, they get more data, that initial advantage will become a stronger advantage. They will do better. They'll get better algorithms, which will give them a bigger advantage, which will give them access to more data and so on. And so we could get the same kind of increasing returns to scale uh, effect in pharmaceuticals. So you think about that and you say, well, then potentially we may live in a world 10 to 20 years from now, which in pharmaceutical time is, is extremely brief. Um, uh, you know, this is an industry where it takes 10 years to put a drug on the market. So a couple of product cycles away where we have not thousands of companies out there capable of discovering drugs, but just a handful, a handful of massive global scale players who dominate that space. And those companies will be in a position to create and capture enormous value. 
And it says that the companies who can't do that are going to be potentially shut out of the discovery game. That's a re- that's there's some public policy implications. There's implications for for pricing, but I want to shift and think a little bit about the implications for a small to medium sized company. What do you do if you're not positioned to play at that scale or to even start to put the money in the literally billions that are being invested now in creating these platforms? How can you compete? And here again, I'm going to come back to this idea about creating networks, collaborative networks. So. It's going to be really important if you're a small to medium-sized company to be embedded in a fairly stable ecosystem. And I think scale can operate at the ecosystem level rather than the company level. And being a great collaborator, again, is going to be critical. And being a company that can work with players who have proprietary clinical data. I mean, that's the real challenge here is if everybody's using the same public data, they don't have an advantage. It's who can get access to the proprietary data. Healthcare systems may become really powerful players as, as they do have massive amounts of clinical data. Now, again, some some policy changes. There's there's privacy issues, um, patient privacy issues, et cetera. It's not as clear as it is in say Amazon, where they can access our data. Patient data is protected differently in different countries, but there'll have to be some some regulatory things to work out. But but hopefully there will be so that we can harness the incredible power of these tools. The third theme is trust. And I think trust is made all the more important. The importance of trust only goes up because of the first two. As companies get more involved in the business of science and as historically, you know, academic players, universities get more involved in the business, society increasingly asks about trust. Can we trust what you're doing? Are you really telling us the truth? We don't have that third party arbiter. And as we start to use artificial intelligence tools, People will say, can we really trust these? Are they really, um, are these things really creating products which are good and safe for us? Now, again, as Ambassador Zappia pointed out, we saw in the last couple of years the, the amazing power of science to transform our lives. The meeting you're having uh, now in person, I, I'm not there in person, but you all, you're all there in person. You would not have been having this had it not been for this convergence of novel science and business and the vaccines that they created. Yet, recall, and in fact, you don't have to recall too long, it's still active debate and discussion. We got to witness and still witness today the, the, the in some ways, shocking skepticism and lack of trust in the companies, the medicine, and the science. Vaccine hesitancy, people not wanting vaccines, um, not trusting, saying it's, it's uh, you know, getting educated by what they read on Facebook and other sources of information and just skepticism and some of the skepticism coming is fairly broad it's it's it is surprising for those of us who are involved with the industry uh, those of you in that room who are scientists and 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 work with incredibly high levels of ethics and care but yet society um large patches of society are skeptical and i think it would be really tragic if the 21st century which could become you know the century where biology and and medical advances really just impact our lives in in really phenomenal ways if those dreams get squashed because society doesn't tr- have trust in the businesses and and then and then politicians take action that could could hamper this um you know, we and again, it's not think about COVID vaccines can literally save your life. And yet we see people routinely choosing not to take them, including people who are at very high risk. So let's not just pretend that every advance will be embraced. This is a fight. It's a big fight. And it's an important fight. Companies have a role to play in this and helping to to drive it. And I think those of you in the scientific world as well, I don't think we could just say, hey, if we're just, you know, just, hey, trust us, we do good science. Uh, society's going to buy into it. I think companies have to do things that go beyond just good public relations. Um, and some of these may require collaboration with governments and not-for-profits and even groups you historically haven't worked with. So uh, what are the things you could do? Well, I think rigor will matter more than ever in your work. Just doing incredibly rigorous and careful work, that I think plays some role in overcoming the skeptics. Um, and you need to publish, but I think more than publishing, it's really having to engage the public, getting the public to understand what you're doing, being really transparent about what you're doing. And that means actually when things aren't going well, or there are errors or mistakes, you're just open about them and say, we got it wrong. Um, 
working with patient groups, not just as a marketing tool, but really as a, as a trust building tool. Uh, other things, clinical trials, making sure they're representative of the population. Um, some of the skepticism comes from some uh, some groups who feel that these products are tried on people not like them, and therefore I don't know if it will be safe. Moderna, as was you know publicly reported, very late in their process of developing um, their vaccine when they were racing against the clock, announced they were slowing down their enrollment, potentially delaying their approval to make sure, as they saw data, that their clinical trials were not enrolling certain underrepresented groups. They said, we have to double down on that. And that became a really important issue for them. And in the end, it, it really helped. That is, they were able to go out to communities and say, we, people who are just like you were in our, in our study. And then I, I mentioned before this transparency. I think this has been an industry that has been awfully secret um, and 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 some of this is, I, I think, is for very good reason, because if there's always these threats of litigation. And I do hope that there will be some policy changes that allow companies to be more transparent without being vulnerable to, to lawsuits. And then finally, and it's a huge topic, and I, I can only just mention it because we could have a whole conference on it, is pricing. I think some of the distrust in the U.S. is caused by pricing that that frankly gets shocking to many people and does not seem fully justified by the clinical benefits of the medicines. And I think it creates a sour, sour view. It allows, certainly allows politicians to, uh, to, to, to use the industry as a target. And of course, the politicians wind up having a, a, a very powerful voice in educating the uh, educating people about the industry. And, you, and there's kind of one side of it there. So I think companies really need to rethink their pricing and how their pricing decisions are perceived and how they're impacting uh, the, the 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 trust. So, I mean, look, I'm going to summarize, stop here. Um, fundamental changes. Look, every time an industry goes through some fundamental change in its technology, it, it is it is it's it's restructured. It has a new architecture. I mean, it's happened in industry after industry. There's no reason to believe that won't happen here. There'll be new winners. There'll be companies who are in the pharmaceutical business who are not pharmaceutical companies today. They're, they're software companies. And there'll be losers. There'll be some companies who have been stalwarts of this industry for 100 years who are not going to make it. Uh, we've seen this time and again. Um, I think if you're in this industry, you've got to embrace this. This is an incredibly exciting time. And I think what should keep you going is the incredibly large impact you can have on people's lives. I think, you know, if a final bit of advice is, again, I'll go back to the Da Vinci theme, embrace your inner Da Vinci, right? He was, Da Vinci was all about the convergence of, of art and science. You're about the convergence of science and business, but it's the same. You're bringing together two worlds. It's about curiosity. It's about learning. It's about it's about impact. So I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to address you. I hope I've provoked some thoughts. Maybe you haven't agreed with everything I said, but that would be a good thing. And I want to say thank you very much.